so I was, you know, pretty old by YouTube standards when I started doing it. I think I was 38. Um, and I had already worked for 20 years, 20 plus, you know, I started working when I was like 15. So I had already been working for like 25 years at that point, which is crazy to say, but, um, so I think when you hear a lot of people talk about how YouTube is a grind and that it's stressful and, you know, rah, 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 and all that stuff, I'm sure to them that's true. But I think a lot of that is a function of them being 20 years old and never having, having had a real job. Um, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not talking like, oh, these kids have no idea. I'm not trying to put it that way. I just literally think that they, it's like anything else. When you were 20 years old, you're probably in situations that felt super difficult to you but looking back now if you're in that same situation you wouldn't break a sweat hey what's up vox and hops heads i'm matt the vocalist of cryptopsy and the host of the vox and hops metal podcast brought to you by sound talent media where i sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives music and craft beer i most certainly hope you've been having a great week i most certainly have been we are now in the final stretch of Vox and Hops' Sober February. I hope you all have been enjoying the episodes this month. I believe that having a balanced relationship with alcohol is something super important, which is why I set up Vox and Hops' Sober February. And I hope that you had the chance to think about your relationship with alcohol. And if it's something that you need to reevaluate, I hope that you take the time to do that. Before we jump into today's episode, I would just like to encourage you to subscribe to the Vox and Hops Metal podcast if you have not already on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I'd also like to ask you to rate it and write a review because when you do that, more people just like yourself will be able to discover the Vox and Hops Metal podcast. When people are looking for a new podcast to listen to, it's exactly like when you are shopping online for something. You scroll down, you read the comments, you want to see if this podcast is worth your time. So if you write a review for the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, it could be your review that encourages another metalhead to become a Vox and Hops head. And that would be something that I would truly appreciate. You should also take the time to sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast newsletter. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That is V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S dot com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a week containing all of the details of everything that has happened in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal podcast throughout the past week, including all details for any episodes which I have dropped, if I have been a guest on someone else's podcast, as well as the links to any upcoming live interviews at Thirsty Thursdays, and the links to the updated Brutal Awakenings playlist, which is curated by my man, Jerry Monk, the metal architect himself. Do yourself a favor, join the party, sign up to the Vox and Hops newsletter because I don't want you missing a single thing. Now on today's episode, I am with a content creator that I have been watching for quite some time now, so I'm very stoked about this episode. Get ready, everyone. This is Vox and Hops episode number 235 with Finn McKenty of the Punk Rock MBA. Oh, I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today I'm with Finn McKenty of the Punk Rock MBA. I am very, very stoked to be with you because uh, not only am I a huge fan and have been a huge fan for quite some time, but we are actually on the same podcast network today together, the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network, and uh, I was very, very stoked to, to have... Uh, a home with you. So uh, let's start with a, how are you doing, Finn? Well, as my mother used to say, I could complain, but nobody would listen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what is the use of complaining in, in this exactly. modern era, right? <laughs> but let's dive deep into something that you hypothetically could complain about, but you're not going to. Uh, how did you cope with this glorious year that we just wrapped up of 2020? Uh, well, you know, I, I have no, I have no complaints, honestly, you know, I've worked from home for, uh, the past couple of years, so it was no big deal for me. Um, and, uh, the, it's actually, you know, it's actually good for me because my wife has been working from home for, you know, almost, well, actually about a year now. Um, uh, so I get to see her more, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, I really have no complaints. It sort of slowed life down a little bit, which for me was a positive, um, and I think helped some people 
maybe refocus a little bit and and understand that perhaps they were making a bigger deal out of some trivial shit than they uh, needed to. So honestly, man, it's, it's great for me. You know, that said, I want to be very, you know, aware and empathetic towards the people that did get you know, screwed by it, that lost their job and stuff like that. I'm, I'm very, and obviously anybody that got sick or, or lost someone uh, who got sick. So I am super empathetic towards that. And I just feel grateful that uh, personally, no, you know, if anything, it was a net positive for me, our business, both my businesses have grown. So I feel very lucky. You are a very, very hardworking individual. And uh, it is something that I look at and I'm inspired by. So, so I, I want to say thank you for, for just, you know, focusing so hard and getting things done and then accomplishing your dreams. But, but you worked very, very hard to get there. And in order to, to get to where you are now, I would like to take a look back on who you were growing up. So, so let's talk about the soundtrack of your youth. Growing up in your parents' or guardian's house, what music did you listen to when you were not in control of the radio? What music did your parents or guardians listen to? Uh, a lot of like R&B, jazz, blues, and funk. So a lot of like uh, James Brown would probably be like the number one thing that comes to mind. Uh, so I think that's probably why I still listen to a lot of that stuff and respond to a lot of like, I don't actually listen to that much like rock, you know, or a lot of the rock stuff that I listen to, you know, is influenced by rap and stuff like that. And um, so the kind of music that really grabs me now. Like we just watched a, uh, I, I don't know. How old are you? I am 37 years old. Okay. So you're old enough. Do, do you remember New Jack Swing? No, I do not know. From like the early nineties, like Belle Biv DeVoe and uh, Boys to Men and like. That, uh, absolutely. That kind of, yeah. yeah. Boys to Men. So, you got me there. Yeah. So that was called New Jack Swing. We just watched a documentary about Teddy Riley um, the other night who I actually did not know created New Jack Swing. Hmm. Um, and that's kind of, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, I really resonate with more so than a lot of rock. Um, and I think that's probably because of my mom. Very cool. What, what band would have been your band, your first love, something that was yours that was not influenced by somebody else? Uh, Suicidal Tendencies. Oh, very nice. Take me, to, take me down that love affair. What was it about that that just enamored you so much? Well, I saw them on uh, MTV News. Uh, they This was 1989 or 90. I think it was 89. Um, they had been banned from playing in LA for like five years or something like that because there was so much like gang violence at their shows. Because, mm. you know, for anybody listening who's not aware, like the suicidals are actually still around as a, a gang. They just call them like mm. the Sueys now. And you'll see, you know, like there's a rapper, Stupid Young, like he talks from Long Beach and he talks about the gangs in their areas, like the ABZs and the Sueys and stuff. And I don't think he even knows that the Sueys means suicidal tendencies <laughs> um but they're like an actual set i think of serenios and uh so there was a lot of you know gang violence and stuff um at their shows at the time and they had been banned for a while they played their first show in la in like five years or something like that and they did an uh, did a uh, an mtv news thing about them and i was like i don't know what this is but it's fucking cool and so i took my <laughs> birthday money you know and went and bought the cassette of uh lights camera revolution wow and then and then you, you put it in you hit play and what were, what was your first response to that sonic versus you know the what you what you heard about the band um you know i don't think that i liked the um music on that particular album as much as um i wanted to because you know for uh, I, I don't know how familiar you are with their catalog but lights camera revolution is you know, one of their more like metal albums. Um, but it's not like, it's not like thrash. It's, it's not really heavy. It's more like funk metal kind of stuff. It was fine. Mm -hmm. Had a couple good songs on it, but um, it was some of their other stuff that I got that I ended up really liking. You know, their, their self-titled is really good, but my favorite one is um, Controlled by Hatred, Feel Like Shit, which is actually a re-recording of the um, No Mercy album which is the guitarist's old band. So that's really what I fell in love with because uh, that was like just like the perfect hybrid of like thrash and hardcore, you know, just pure like Southern California, uh, like crossover type shit. And I was really into the packaging too because it was all like, you know, 80s like gang graffiti type 
artwork and stuff all over the packaging, which I was very influential on me and everyone else. I mean, if you go look at, you know, a rebel eight line sheet, it's all that. So, um, I was not the only one who was influenced by that. <laughs> Take me to your, your first show, Finn. Do you remember the first live music experience you ever had? Uh, the very first one that I can remember, I was like super young. My mom was always shocked that I remembered it. I was like three or something. Wow. Um, it was some like jazz fusion festival that um, her like boyfriend, whatever, um, was in some fusion band. And uh, he took us to some fusion festival and I remember eating uh, hummus out of a pita on a blanket <laughs> watching some of these like weird ass this is the early 80s so it was probably yeah. like it's probably actually some fucking cool like I remember he was really into Chick Korea, if you know who that is I do um, not know Chick Korea is like one of the OGs of like 80s fusion um, Very cool. look it up it'll look like a joke to you but like <laughs> some of the best fucking musicians you'll ever see in any genre like dave weckl was yes, the drummer. yeah yeah so that's where dave weckl got a start with chick korea um so that's like my first memory is that fusion festival in bellingham washington in like 1983 or something that's amazing that's amazing and eating hummus no other kids eating hummus in the 80s your mom was cool she made tofu in the fucking sink she had like <laughs> yes. organic you know compost bins you know, in the backyard and not, not cause she was a hipster. Cause we were poor. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to pay for tofu. So she made it herself. Uh, cool. Cool. Before her time. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Vox and hops is all about hanging out with my metal friends normally and talking about their lives, music and craft beer. Now, now do you partake in beer? Is that something you enjoy? Uh, what are you drinking on your side tonight with me? And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Beer is probably the second most disgusting thing I have ever consumed in my life, as far as beverages go. The only thing worse is um, whatever the fuck Hennessy is. That would be, it's not bourbon. It's a- Cognac, maybe? Mm, I don't know. I should all know All that this. shit, all those like brown liquors are absolutely vile. Like, no whiskey, it's an Irish whiskey, I don't know, whatever the fuck it is. It is <laughs> unbearable. Like it literally turns my stomach just thinking of the smell. Um, the second grossest thing I ever had was uh, dark beer. I had one sip of dark beer once. Uh, I was in kind of like a death metal grindcore kind of band with this dude years ago. And uh, this is when I started, I didn't start, I didn't drink till I was 21. And uh, so he was like, oh, you got to try dark beer. It's great. And I was like, all right. You know, I remember some skinhead band singing about dark beer. Sure, why not? So I tried a sip of it. It was so gross. Like I literally almost puked from drinking like a sip of it. Not, you know, not like, oh, I drank too much. I'm gonna it was like the taste of this liquid is so disgusting that like I'm going to vomit. And I... And, Mind you, this is like a year after I like I ate my roommate's boogers for a joke. <laughs> so literally this dark beer was worse than her fucking snot. <laughs> Take me to why you were 21 years old when you did finally partake in alcohol. Uh, well, my mom was an alcoholic mm -hmm. uh, and my dad was... Uh, not an alcoholic. Well, I asked him, he used to, he did a lot of drugs, like serious like shooting speed balls in your neck type shit and shit. Uh, and i remember asking him once if he was a junkie and he's like no nah, i just did a lot of drugs because <laughs> he because he just decided to quit pretty much cold turkey crazy you know he got a job as a corrections officer and he's like all right enough of that and he just quit and that was it there was never any substance abuse issues he was just like i'm i'm over it um, but because of that, and then I had my uncle went to prison for drugs. I had like four or five uncles that went to prison for drugs. And wow. my mom's childhood best friend drank herself to death. One of my earliest memories is her friend, Marsha, dying of, I guess, alcohol. I don't know what it was exactly. I just remember her dying in the hospital of alcohol-related stuff. So I was understandably, uh, you know, basically scared of slash not interested in like drugs or alcohol because, you know, I, a lot of people, I think, experiment with that stuff because they're curious Mm -hmm. um, but I would just ask my dad, Hey, what's PCP like? And he's like, well, I remember I took it once at a party and this happened, you know, 
So yeah, it's not that great. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> you had your repertoire of everything already. There's no point yeah. in going and experimenting. Exactly. I'm like, no, oh, eh. I don't know. My dad didn't make it sound that cool. I guess I'll steer clear of it. Um, but what I'm drinking right now is uh, just water because I'm trying uh, to drink more water these days, even though the doctor, I've asked every, you know, the, the, the need for hydration beyond when you're thirsty, there's no medical evidence to support that that I'm aware of. I've researched it. I asked my doctor, they all said, no, you don't have to. Um, but I'm doing it anyway, because why not? There doesn't seem to be any downside either. Uh, and uh, it's better than drinking other stuff. Absolutely. The only consequence would be you'd have to pee a lot. Yeah, I can live with that. Uh, I used to drink a lot of like mixed drinks. Like I would, like when I was in college and mind you, I didn't go to school till I was 25. So I was like 28 when I was drinking this, drinking a lot of like Powerade and vodka because I would just <laughs> go, you know, party with the people from school and, you know, like alcohol tastes horrible. I don't, I don't think anyone who, I don't understand how anybody can think alcohol tastes good. And so we were all broke and uh, it's just like, well, what's going to get me shit faced the fastest? Some of this cheap vodka with a little spritz of uh, fucking orange Powerade in there. All right, let's do it. <laughs> On my side, I am going to be drinking a non-alcoholic brew. There's a lot of water in it, but there's some other things in it too. So this is a Vial Sans Alcohol. It means a beer without alcohol. This is their sour. Uh, it has a 0.5% well, ABV. There's, there's craft non-alcoholic beer? Absolutely. It's a whole oh, thing happening right now. Interesting. And it's uh, delicious. So this is going to be a uh, light tart and uh, I'm going to crack it open. Tell me about growing up, you know, going to high school or, or being a teenager in general and not being that guy that's partying. Was that something that was detrimental to your, your social status? Or I don't think so. No. Did you just not care? I didn't care. Uh, and actually none of my friends really were into that stuff either. I mean, I guess I knew people that drank a little bit it just, we just weren't like that and i hung out with like all the you know skater kids and stuff like that and we just weren't like that you know um it was never a topic of conversation it just it just nobody was into it you know um and i was also really into uh uh i was on the debate team for three years in high school which was kind of one of my main um one of my main things like i went to debate camp uh, on weekends, I would go to debate tournaments and stuff like that. I was like super into it. We ended up getting uh, ninth in state when I was a senior, which is pretty cool. I think we could have done a lot better if I had taken it a little bit more seriously. Um, I bet we could have gotten, you know, top three or something like that if I would have tried harder. In hindsight, I wish I would have. That's what, what you're, you're laughing. Why are you laughing? Oh, I'm just thinking. I'm thinking that 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 I, I have. I want to go somewhere in the future about if you're ever satisfied with with achieving stuff uh no i am it's it's not um I'm, I'm actually very conscious not to do that uh move of always being on the treadmill and mm -hmm. like trying to go for the next thing um but at the same time i also want to like just because you can do achieve more doesn't mean you should you know what mm -hmm. i mean like i could make a million dollars a year if i wanted to i'm 100 fucking percent confident of that like there's zero doubt in my mind that if i wanted to make a million dollars in this year i could do it um but i don't want to because that comes at its own cost of you know your personal life and your you know oftentimes your physical and mental health and stuff too and i i've decided i don't want that um you know but i think it's good to sort of make that as a deliberate decision rather than just sort of rolling the dice and letting whatever happens happens you know so like with debate um, I probably could have, I just, I didn't think this way at that time because I was 17. Um, but, uh, I, I could have, we, we could have done better if I would have taken it more seriously, which would have been kind of cool, but you know, it's all good. I enjoyed it. It's one of the best things I ever did with my life. All my videos, by the way, if anybody ever did debate in high school or college, uh, if you're familiar with like cross X debate, um, policy debate, all my videos are based on the one AC speech and debate. There's really? like sort of a specific format for this speech with like, you know, you demonstrate that the status quo wasn't working and here's the, here's the reasons why that's bad and here's your plan and here's why your plan will solve that. Uh, and all my videos are essentially based on that, except for the ones that are just totally humor, but the serious ones are all based on that. 
That's so interesting. That's so interesting. It's like, I always think about that, like that Slumdog Millionaire movie where, where you know all the answers in your life because of everything that you've done. I've never you, seen it. What's the premise? Oh, it's I basically remember it, but I've never seen this, it. this young child that ends up on who wants to be a millionaire and he knows every answer because of things that he's experienced in his life. Oh. And then he ends up winning and the guy thinks he's cheating and he ends up getting tortured at the end because you cheated, you cheated, but he actually really did leave. So through. they're asking him about like obscure shit from like India or wherever he's from. Yes, I, can, I don't remember. He he know, exactly. Everything is like a part of his life. So, so you used your debate experience to craft all your videos, which obviously work very well because you guys are at, now at 280,000 subscribers. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing. I, I, that's, I think about the Slumdog Millionaire thing. We talk about it in my life all the time. Oh, I should watch that movie. It sounds like oh, that's it's great. a good yeah. metaphor for life. I think it's David Fincher. I could be wrong there. Yeah. Okay. That sounds right. Yeah. I remember that yeah. movie getting a lot of press and like the indie film magazines and stuff back then. And they all loved Absolutely. it. This is a uh, really cool. It's light. It's uh, got a tropical bite to it. Uh, very cool. If you can get your hands on it up here in Quebec, please do. Delicious. What does a tropical bite mean? How would you describe that? It tastes like um, papaya, uh, a little bit of pineapple, but uh, without the juicy enough, juiciness of it, it's still got a little dry finish. Yeah, I see. Very interesting. Uh, let's dive straight into the punk rock MBA. I know that you guys, or you, started this after doing a whole bunch of stuff. You, you, you have a vast array of experience behind you coming from Creative Live to, to helping launch URM. Um, so, so take me to why, why, where did you get this idea? Why did you start this YouTube channel? Well, I mean, the honest, like simple truth is that I wanted to prove to myself and to the world that I was good at my job. You know, my hmm. job being marketing and at the end of the day, Marketing is about getting attention for things. And um, I just kind of wanted to prove that I could do it. Like, That's so cool. you know, YouTube is still is where the action is. Like it's the premier social media platform. Um, TikTok is probably getting more attention right now, but, and, and it's awesome. And I respect the shit out of everybody that's succeeding on TikTok, but um, YouTube is still the gold standard. If you talk to, you know, the big TikTokers, they all want to be YouTubers and move their audience over there and stuff. So, you know, that's, that's one of my most proud accomplishments. And I, I think about it, like you never see, you know, to use a music analogy an an ad, a, a Facebook ad or something like that, or someone on, on the internet talking about, you know, teaching music lessons, you are like, who the fuck is this guy? And you look him up and they've never been in any sort of project that, had any kind of success and you're like, why would I listen to this person? Um, <laughs> and, and there's times where, you know, that's not a hundred percent true. There are some people who are fantastic teachers that have never been successful musicians, but I didn't want to be that person. I didn't want to, you know, present myself as some sort of an expert on marketing and yet have people say, well, if you're so great at this, why don't you do it for yourself? I don't think that logic is a hundred percent perfect, but that was sort of the challenge. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I guess I did it, which is pretty amazing. It absolutely is. And, and it's, you know, at what point now are you going to continue, you're going to continue punk rock, but still act as a marketing expert. Is that what's happening right now? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I never thought I would it would be this successful to be honest with you. I thought, you know, maybe if I get 10,000, if I could get to a place where I'm regularly getting 10,000 views on a video, I, I will be happy. And I, and I would have been happy with that. Um, ended up being much bigger than that. So it's like, you know, uh, as, as I heard somebody say, what happens when the cat catches the squirrel, you know, mm. they're like, Oh shit, what do I do now? <laughs> um, so, you know, I continue to have success and, you know, continue to put out videos that do well and it grows every month. And, I'm just going to ride that fucking train as long as I can keep it on the tracks. Um, and, you know, in the background, kind of figure out what to do with it. Like I'm working on a book, for example. Exactly. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I've, I've got a tiger by the tail and I'm not going to let go until I have to. Hmm. Very cool. Very, what are some of the biggest challenges when running a huge channel like this? Well, you know, I'll talk about them for myself versus other people. So I was, you know, pretty old by YouTube standards when I started doing it. I think I was 38. Um, and 
I had already worked for 20 years, 20 plus, you know, I started working when I was like 15. So I had already been working for like 25 years at that point, which is crazy to say, but, um, so I think when you hear a lot of people talk about how YouTube is a grind and that it's stressful and, you know, rah, 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 and all that stuff, I'm sure to them that's true. But I think a lot of that is a function of them being 20 years old and never having, having had a real job. Uh Um, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm not talking like, Oh, these kids have no idea. I'm not trying to put it that way. I just literally think that they, it's like anything else. When you were 20 years old, you're probably in situations that felt super difficult to you. But looking back now, if you're in that same situation, you wouldn't break a sweat. And so I think it's, it's kind of that. So for me, the challenge is just balance, just, just time management, really, you know, cause I have other things that I do. And then, you know, I'm married and I try not to, you know, try to be in shape and stuff. So it's just balancing it with everything else. Um, there's some, you know, there, there's, there's some difficulty, I suppose to, you know, you get a lot of shitty comments and stuff like that. Um, and you know, that bothers me a little bit, but not really. You know, because I mean, I've been making, I started out making zines when I was like 14, 15 years old. So I've been on the receiving of that, into that stuff, you know, for decades. So that doesn't bother me so much. I mean, you know, you're in a well-known band, so you've heard all these things a million times. Maybe some days it gets to you a little bit, but most of the time it's just like, well, that's the internet for you. I say it all the time. Rule number one, never read the comments. Rule number two, rule number two, never respond. <laughs> well, I do both of those things. I know. And I wanted to talk about that too. <laughs> it's a deliberate decision on my part, which may or may not be the right one and, and, and probably won't scale forever. Mm-hmm. But the reason why is because I learn a lot from them. Mm. Um, the, you know, to me, I, well, here's, here's the biggest challenge for YouTube. I would say for me is continuing to come up with ideas for relevant content that are beyond sort of what I can spit out off the top of my head, you know, like, I don't know if you saw my death metal video, but like, that's, that was easy for me to make because I was fucking obsessed with death metal in the nineties and two thousands. So it's not hard for me to make a video about that era of death metal, but I don't really know that much about what, that what's going on in death metal now. Um, And I don't want to be someone who's just sort of stuck in a particular you know, moment in time or anything like that. I don't want to keep beating the same horse that I've, you know, uh, that I've, that I've talked about before. Um, so that's why I read the comments because that tells me, you know, people say like, well, you know, if you're interested in this, you should, if you're interested in X, you should really look at Y, you know? And if I see 50 people in my comments say that, I'm going, mm-hmm, well, mm-hmm. there's probably something here. Or you idiot, how come you didn't talk about why? And most of the time I, you know, most of the time it's a deliberate decision on my part, but sometimes they're right. I'm like, oh, I probably should have talked about that, huh? So that's a way for me to learn. I just listen. Like, I, I think it's an underrated thing. You know, it's called social media for a reason. It's because you're supposed to be social on there. And I think a lot of people just use it to broadcast and they don't listen. And I understand why. And that's, you know, for some people that's fine. But for me personally, I find a lot of value in the comments, but you do have to balance that with, you know, keeping your sanity. And it, I think, uh, I, I don't know who said it, but um, a good piece of advice is, you know, ignore the good stuff and the bad stuff. Cause you don't want, you know, it's like, I'm sure you've met people that heap you with praise and tell you you're the best thing in the world and this, that, and the other. And you're like, that's cool, but you literally don't know me. So there's no way that that could possibly be a valid piece of, you know, like how, how do you know that I'm so great? You've literally never met me. Hmm. You know what I mean? And you can't, you don't want to get lost in the sauce and believe the positive stuff or the negative stuff. Hmm. But I That's think if you just listen and learn from both of them without really internalizing them, I think is the, the key for me. It's very wise, very, very wise. And it's a good way to stay on top of the pulse of the the, the music scene and all the, the stuff that you're involved with and you well, can't so, cover it all. So so if you do find a subject that you do want to dig into, how do you go about researching it aside from just the comment section? Uh, you know, just the usual, like 
Google and YouTube and, you know, um, I go look at their social media, you know, the same way, the same way as I did. Like when I was a kid, um, especially because with the kind of music we're into, it was so hard to find anything about this kind of stuff. Especially I mean, I back remember, then. What's that? Especially back then, the beginning when you started. Yeah. I mean, I remember there was an issue of Guitar World, I think, one of the guitar magazines that had like a death metal round table in mm -hmm. like 92 or something that had like death, obituary, morbid angel and deicide in it. And it was probably three pages long, but it seemed like the fucking just Bible of information to me in reality. Like if I reread it recently, cause I'm like, <laughs> this sucks. It's all pictures. Yeah. No, no, it was, it was, it was an inner, it was just them talking guitars, you know, but you know, by today's standards, that would be like trash content. Mm -hmm. But you know, back then it was so when the fuck were you ever going to hear an interview with Richard Burnell from fucking morbid angel? Like, never that was like certainly not in a magazine you could get at the supermarket <laughs> um so that was like the fucking you know buried treasure for me and i just do that same kind of i, I just that's just my nature is like if i'm interested in something i'm good at sort of scouring for interesting information about it because i acquired that skill as a kid just trying to find fucking anything i possibly could about this kind of weird music that was impossible to find out about that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, what would have been the best piece of advice that you received that helped uh, build Punk Rock NBA? Uh, well, I mean, are, are you talking about like, I mean, I could, I could go broad and, you know, meta and talk about some of the things my, my dad taught me, or I could talk specifically about YouTube, which, which sounds like a better direction to you. I would go YouTube. Okay. Uh, so my friend Ryan Bruce, uh, better known as Fluff, um, he's a pretty well-known guitar YouTuber. Probably a lot of people listening to this know who he is. Um, I've known him for years before I had uh, the YouTube channel, and he was gracious enough to let me pick his brain. Um, and the best thing he ever told me is, this was at, uh, at a wedding. I think maybe he had a couple drinks or something. Um, he said, uh, if... When it, with regard to titles and thumbnails, if they're not cringing, you're not trying hard enough. Mm. Um, and, you know, one thing you'll notice with my titles and thumbnails is they are definitely cringe. That's why I put <laughs> like those stupid bootleg emojis in there, you know, mm -hmm. because it's just a, a facet of human psychology. And, if, and, and I've learned since then that this is actually confirmed by psychology experiments that like we seek out that emotion of being like mildly annoyed. You know, and, and if you think about it, think about the content you click on. It's that you're like, what the fuck is this bullshit? I better yeah. click on it. That's true. <laughs> it's so stupid, but that's just how the human brain works. And so, you know, I, I think the hardest part for most creators is getting people to pay attention to your stuff in the first place. Let's assume your content is good, but if, if you can't even get them to click in the first place, it doesn't matter how good it is. And so that, that was a really helpful piece of advice from him that's very true and i am also interested in what your father said well like i said my dad was a corrections officer um meaning that you know when you when you watch one of these shows like you know lock up or whatever and you see the you know prison guards going around and checking on people and saying hey you know we heard you got a weapon you know we're going to turn over your cell and look for it you know that was my dad's job for 20 some years um and uh you know because of that and my, my stepmom also worked at a uh, facility across the street from there that was for sex offenders. Um, mm. And so, you know, between the two of them, I would say that the two things I learned is one, like, you know, the idea of like choice and consequence, meaning you can do whatever you want. You just got to live with the consequences, you know? So he eventually went on to become a counselor and a counselor in prison isn't really like, oh, you know, Matt, tell me how you're feeling. Let me pat you on the back and hold you. It's more like, Hey, I see you've got a uh, parole hearing coming up in nine months. If you want your best chance uh, at, at, at getting paroled, you know, you should uh, take this anger management class and, um, you know, this job training program, make sure you don't get any more infractions for this or that. And, you know, the inmate might be like, well, fuck you, John, you can't tell me what to do. You're not my fucking dad. And he'd go, oh, all right, you can do whatever you want. I'm just telling you that's the way it is. You don't have to like it. Mm -hmm. Um 
And he always kind of treated me the same way too. Of like, well, here's your options. You do what you want, but you got to live with it. Um, and I, I think that that's very, you know, I think that's a good reminder for people making content too. For example, if you want to get a lot of attention, the number one way to do that is to talk shit about people who are famous or successful. Um, you know, top 10 reasons why Matt is a dumb piece of shit that should kill himself. <laughs> you know, that, that is the best way to get attention, but you're going to have to live with that, with, with the nature of that attention, you know? And I think you get what you put out. So I would just question, is that really what you want? Like, is that the mm. attention you want? If, if it is, go for it. Um, but I would say just be, be thoughtful about that. So I always consider whenever I'm making a video, I pretend that the person I'm talking about is sitting next to me and that I have to read it to them, to their face. Really? You know, uh -huh. would, would I be comfortable saying it? And, you know, I could still be critical, you know? Like I could tell you, hey, you know, your last album, uh, he here's a couple of things that I think could have been better about it. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get mad at me about that. No, you know, no. as opposed to, yeah, last John was fucking trash. Yeah, you suck, dude. Yeah, you <laughs> suck, God. You know, th that you're, you know, because I mean, th say that, to, you know, again, you just use the test of saying it to someone's face. Um, mm. So that's, that's a very valuable one. Another, uh, along the same lines, another very valuable thing that he kind of um, taught me without ever really saying, and I don't think is like conflict de-escalation because, um, you know, cops and corrections officers, you know, to a lot of people are sort of in the same bucket as uh, military, but they're really not because um, for cops and corrections officers, force is the absolute last resort. You really don't want to go there you really want to de-escalate the situation so that you don't have to use force. Um, and so he was always very good at like talking people down. He was also trained as a, a hostage negotiator. And there's, um, there's a guy named Chris Voss who has a book called never split the difference. That's about like using hostage negotiation techniques in like business. And wow. I, I listened to a podcast with him. And I was like, what the fuck? This guy sounds fucking exactly like my dad, <laughs> you know, like, all right, Matt, I hear what you're saying. You know, I, I can understand why you'd be frustrated. It sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like we've done a lot of things that you're not happy with, <laughs> you know? Well, uh, frustrating, uh, you know, frustrating yeah. teenage years. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I like, I'd really like to help you out, Matt, but for me to do that, there's, there's a couple of things that I'm going to need to ask you for, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, uh, those kind of skills really serve me well in life in general, but in particular on YouTube, like I don't, at least I hope not. I hope I don't like freak out at people in the comments. You know, mm. I just sort of take that same, <laughs> like when people get mad at him, you know, whatever, you, there's be a few occasions. I remember people getting pissed off at him, you know, fucking getting his oil changed or whatever. And some guy giving a hard time and he just sort of how he would just sort of look at you, pause for a minute and go, well, it sounds like you've got some strong feelings about this. <laughs> Which makes people just that much matter. Yeah, but, you know, he's it's just holding up a mirror and saying, well, Matt, it sounds like you've got some strong feelings about this. <laughs> and then just let you go on and on and on. And you're like, all right, well, yeah, I hear you. It's just not, we're just not letting this escalate. It's not going to happen. And I think that's a good skill for creators, you know, because as your audience grows, the amount of hateful slash crazy people in your audience will grow too, because whatever X percent of the world is crazy and hateful. And you, you know, if you're, if you're getting a million people a month watching your videos, then some percentage of those people are going to be hateful, crazy people. And you got to learn how to deal with it. Absolutely. It's true. And, and, and internalizing that is just, that's why a lot of people don't read the comments because for them, it's a binary choice between if I read this shit, I'm, I'm going to internalize it and it's going to make me feel horrible. And mm -hmm. so I'm just not going to read it. But in an ideal world, you can read that stuff and not internalize. You can compartmentalize and say, well, is there something I can learn from here? Learn from this? Cool. If not, all right, well, I'm just going to let it go. This is, I'm not going to let this upset me. Mm, very wise. Very, very wise. I don't know if that makes sense, but it does. It 100% makes sense, especially when it comes to to cryptocurrency and releasing new material. 
<laughs> You're not Lord Worm. Exactly. <laughs> you fucking piece of shit. And I, I tend saw to only Lord remember. Worm in 1991. He, you got nothing on him. <laughs> Take me to, to why starting a podcast version. It's a little bit different. Uh, talk to me about why why a podcast then. Well, why did you start a podcast? Well, I started a podcast because I love podcasts. I'm an avid podcast consumer. And uh, I love asking my friends out on tour annoying questions just to dig deeper into them while drinking some craft beer. So it was a very natural thing for me. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's basically the same for me. Um, you know, just to, to layer on top of that, I mean, like you said, I just like talking to smart people about what they're doing. I like, you know, I could sit down next to a fucking, um, I don't know. I love talking to people about their work, whatever it is. Like if I sit down next to somebody that owns like a landscaping company at a wedding or something like that, I love hearing about it. I could listen mm. to them talk all night about running a landscaping company because I just love hearing about people's work. It really doesn't matter to me what it is. I just love hearing about it. And really that's what my show was about is I talk to people who have, you know, made a living doing something cool. About, and I talk to them about like how they got there and, you know, what they're doing now and try to pull out things that might be helpful to the audience. So, I mean, that's really it. And then, you know, from a business perspective, um, those are conversations that I think, you know, it's related to, but different from my YouTube content. You know, I talk about, you know, kind of the business side of music and creativity, but in, not in as, in as, as much detail uh, as you can do on a podcast. And, you know, on, on YouTube, you got to keep things a little bit more entertaining than uh -huh. you can do in a 45 minute or 60 minute podcast. So it's kind of a way of like, I know that not, I, I know that my, um, the majority of my audience isn't necessarily interested in that, which is fine. But I know there is some percentage of my audience that's interested in that, which is the the portion of the audience that I want to invest in the most. Uh, and this is a way for me to kind of go deeper with those people, um, you know, in a, in a format that doesn't kind of require me to bastardize it for YouTube. Mm. You mentioned uh, the book. So, so what, what is going on with this book? Tell me about that. And uh, sure. when can we expect it? Well, I hope to have a first draft of it done this year. Uh, cool. and then publish it maybe early to mid next year. Reason being that it takes a long time, I think, to do a good book. And the way I'm thinking of it is something like um, Tim Ferriss for Hardcore Kids is kind of like my my pitch for it. So it's going to be like a, you know, essentially, I, I hope a very useful, practical, tactical kind of uh, book on how to be a successful, happy person to the extent that I can help anybody do that. And it's not just going to be me. It's going to be essentially like somewhere around like 20 chapters. Each chapter is going to be illustrating some particular kind of idea or concept or rule. For example, like don't ask for permission is the one that I was working on most recently. And for each one of those, I'll have some sort of an example of somebody or company or whatever from our world uh, who has done that, for example, like SST records or discord or something like that, you know, here's, here's how they sort of achieve success by operating, uh, uh, under the principle of don't ask for permission. And then I'll follow that up with kind of my analysis or thoughts on how you can put that into practice for yourself. For example, with that particular rule, like you've probably seen a lot of people, like how many people do you know who have been working on an EP for like six years? <laughs> yes, of course. Many, you know, lots. <laughs> the idea being that like a lot of these people are waiting until there's some sort of sign from the heavens that, that, okay, now like everything's good. You, if you release it now, it'll be successful. Well, that, that never happens. There's no such thing as permission. There's no person or, you know, cosmic power or whatever that's ever going to like give you their blessing and give you the green light. And now it's time to go ahead. You just got to do it. You can't stay stuck on, you know, on the launch pad forever. Um, and, and I think that that's, you know, that's, that's something that a, a lot of people, I've, I don't really struggle with that personally. I've always been the type to just kind of do shit. Um, but I've seen that a lot of people do struggle with that. So that would be an example of the kind of content that's in the book. Um, you know, there'll be probably around 20 chapters or so like that. Very cool. I'm very excited about that. I'll definitely, definitely look into it and read it avidly. Very exciting. I appreciate it. 
let's wrap and this I'm, up and normally. I'm, I'm going to have E40 do the audiobook. Really? No, but no. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> normally, I wrap this up with a hangover cure, but that's not your bag. So let's wrap this up with a different well, type of question. The best, the best hangover cure is unfortunately a bad idea too, which is Adderall. Um, mm, see that no one's ever said that to me. Really? Nope. Did anybody say cocaine? Neither. No. <laughs> you have some amateur alcoholics on this show. <laughs> really? Why? Why do they work? Uh, because their speed. You know, like, it does not matter how fucking hungover you are. I remember waking up just deathly hungover. Like, you know, that feeling of like somebody just hit you in the head with a sledgehammer and every cell in your body is just like begging for mercy. You know, that level of like hungover. And I slept maybe an hour. And, you know, you take, uh, take 40 milligrams of Adderall and 15 minutes later, you feel like you're fucking 110%. Really? Don't do this at home, people. <laughs> no, it's, it's a horrible idea. You shouldn't do it. But I did it every day for many years and it's <laughs> bad news. Wow. Wow. But let's wrap this up with a, a more positive spin. Um, that probably was the... works too, but that's because that's essentially the same thing as Adderall. But don't do that either. <laughs> what would be... Uh, the best part of COVID for you? Best part of COVID for me, hands down, has been spending more time with my wife. She works for Amazon, which is a demanding uh, AWS for anybody who knows what that is, Amazon Web Services. It's a demanding place to work. Uh, and so, you know, she was commuting before and stuff and, you know, we would make the most of it. But uh, it's been really great just, you know, seeing her 24-7. Uh, and I hope that we'll be able to continue the work from home thing for as long as possible. Cause that's a huge quality of life boost. Absolutely. Finn, thank you so, so much for taking the time talking to me about, uh, no, I say life, metal and craft beer, but, uh, you know, being a content creator, being, uh, extremely intelligent, uh, and uh, your approach towards being a content creator. I am, uh, very inspired and in awe of what you've created. Uh, I want to say a massive cheers to you. Thank you for taking the time with me. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Cheers. My water bottle. My trans. Look, <laughs> it's like Wonder Woman's jet. Wow. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. Finn is a legend. What an excellent conversation. He is so insightful, he is so intelligent. I really enjoy his content. If you have not checked out the Punk Rock MBA on YouTube before or his podcast, you should absolutely do that because his content is always super entertaining, intelligent, well thought out, and really well put together. I've been a fan for years, so this was a great chat. I really enjoyed it. I hope that you guys did too. If you enjoyed this Fox and Hops episode, you should subscribe to it on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, you should rate it and write a review because when you do that, more people just like yourself will be able to discover the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. I'm also inviting you to the party. That's right. Join the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast newsletter. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That is V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a week containing all of the details of everything that has happened throughout the previous week in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. Do it. Join the party. Sign up to the Vox and Hops newsletter because I don't want you missing a single thing. The Vox and Hops Metal Podcast is brought to you by Sound Helen Media. I have one more episode coming at you tomorrow, but until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops heads. Oh,